Okay, so uh, let me have your attention. You see, uh, we are now more or less uh, you know comfortable with thinking of the point at infinity, of functions uh, behaving at infinity, analyticity at infinity, singularities at infinity. Okay, so uh, you know uh, we wanted to do that because we needed to look at functions uh, on the extended plane. Okay and uh, uh, this viewpoint is very very important because it is not uh, normally when you do complex analysis say for example in a first course you are worried about only functions on the plane okay on the complex plane you are not worried about the point at infinity okay and uh, but but if you include the point at infinity you get more information <coughs> that is the point. So, uh, so I, I explained this last time but let me again repeat it. So, I am saying uh, for example look at uh, let us take an entire function okay let us take an entire function uh, uh, take a non constant entire function okay. Then uh, if you look at the little Picard theorem what it will tell you is that the image of the whole plane is going to be either the whole plane or the whole plane minus one point uh, which is one value which it may not take and that is the that is the best possible I mean you it, it cannot miss two values. What it means is that if, if an entire function misses more than one value it has to be a constant okay. So, you see uh, and of course you have uh, 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 but then you know if I ask you now take this entire function and take the exterior of a circle of sufficiently large radius okay and take its image what will the image look like okay uh, then you know you do not you do not have an answer you do not have an answer. So, whereas uh, uh, for example, if you knew that the that if you can think of infinity as uh, uh, an you know uh, a singular point and in, in, in fact if infinity is an essential singular point okay then you can apply the great Picard theorem which will tell you that the image of every deleted neighborhood of infinity will be either the full plane or the plane minus a point okay. So, you can use that which is a more powerful theorem to say that if you have an entire function and suppose it is it is not algebraic namely mm -hmm. that infinity uh, it is a transcendental entire function that is infinity is a you know essential singularity then uh, if you take uh, if you take the exterior of a circle of sufficiently large radius for that matter if you take exterior of any circle okay because exterior of any circle is going to be a deleted neighborhood of the point at infinity in the extended plane and if you apply Picard, big, the big Picard theorem you get the information that the uh, image of the exterior of any circle is always uh, is always uh, going to be the whole plane or the whole plane minus a point. Okay. And it will also give you the additional information that all the all the values it takes uh, it takes on infinitely many times 
okay. So, you see the you see the advantage of thinking of the point at infinity okay, you get more information. So, um, so along these lines you know that you know for example, uh, you can characterize entire functions as transcendental or algebraic based on whether infinity is an essential singularity or not. If infinity is not an essential singularity, then it is a pole or a removable singularity. If infinity is a removable singularity, then uh, by Liouville's theorem the function has to be constant. If infinity is a pole, then the function has to be a polynomial and otherwise it is a transcendental entire function. Infinity is an essential singularity. Okay. Now, what we need to do is see we are the whole aim of all this all this is we are trying to prove uh, the big Picard theorem and uh, as a corollary deduce the little Picard theorem okay. and uh, you know theory required for that is to do analysis on compact spaces of meromorphic functions. Okay. So, uh, you have to study the topology and you have to understand do some analysis using compact families of meromorphic functions. So, uh, we need to worry about meromorphic functions. So, let me so let me start by <coughs> telling you what a meromorphic function is I have told this before, but let us go into that a little bit more detail because that is uh, something that gives you a link to algebra. Okay. So, the, the, the reason why a lot of complex geometry is connected to algebra is because of the uh, fact that uh, all the meromorphic functions they form a field naturally and that field is an extension field of the complex numbers because the complex numbers always uh, can be thought of as constant functions every every complex number corresponds to the constant function given by that number. So, you know uh, uh, the, the and constant functions are of course, meromorphic okay, they are analytic. So, you see that uh, the field of meromorphic functions as a field extension of the complex field uh, is uh, the, the properties of this field extension in, in algebra for example, in Galois theory and things like that, that determine a lot about the geometry of the domain uh, on which you are studying the meromorphic functions. Okay. And this is extensively used for example, in classifying Riemann surfaces and more generally if you want to classify manifolds and so on complex manifolds you can use this theory. Okay. It gives you an interface between complex analysis and topology and uh, algebraic geometry complex geometry okay. and algebra in that sense. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so, what is a meromorphic function? Uh, the definition is pretty simple. It is a function which has uh, which is analytic on a domain, okay. uh, but the only singularities it has are poles. Okay, that is the definition of a meromorphic function. So, let me write that down. Uh, uh, so, the field of meromorphic functions uh, so here is a definition uh, let d in uh, the extended complex plane be a domain okay so i am looking at a domain uh, in the extended complex plane uh, by mind you it means that it is an open connected set and of course we always is assume that it is non empty okay a meromorphic function function on d is either an an analytic function analytic function on d or a function that is analytic on d except for poles okay so uh, so a meromorphic function uh, by definition is a function that might could be defined on D or D minus points where uh, those points mm -hmm. will be of course isolated they, they will be of course singularities okay. uh, and the point is that they have to be isolated in fact they have to be poles okay. this is the uh, this is the definition. Okay. So, uh, so, it's, so, we say that uh, we, we often use uh, uh, the uh, abbreviation I mean we use this short phrase analytic except for poles that is the that is what meromorphic means okay. and 
Now we need to make a, a few observations. The first thing is that you see the number of poles, okay, the set of poles of the function, it may be of course empty in which case the function is actually analytic or holomorphic. But if it is not analytic then it has poles at least one pole and the fact is that set of poles in D will be a countable set. So the first thing is that you cannot have an uncountable set, set of poles. So a meromorphic function will have only countably many poles and uh, what is the reason for that? The reason for that is because of second countability. Okay. See the, 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 uh, the complex plane is just R2 and you know Euclidean spaces Rn they are all second countable because they have a countable basis. So you can take all the uh, you can take all the open balls centered at points with rational coordinates and with radii given by rational numbers okay, and use the fact that uh, the rational numbers form a countable set okay. and then you get this uh, collection of uh, uh, open balls centered at uh, rational points with rational coordinates and having rational radii as a countable co collection of uh, uh, open sets and they will form a basis for the topology okay. in the sense that any open set is a union of such sets. Okay, and uh, the intersection of any two sets like that of, of this type again is a union of sets of that form. Okay, so it is a basis for the topology. So the topology has a countable basis, this is second countability and now uh, in particular for example the plane R2 or the complex plane as topologically is second countable. So you know uh, uh, what you can do is suppose you have uh, so and of course any subspace of a second countable space is also second countable. because uh, you all you have to do is that you have to take the countable base uh, countable base for the bigger space and intersect it with the subspace to get a countable base for the subspace okay so uh, uh, so if you take the domain it took, you take any domain in the complex plane or extended complex plane it will be second countable okay and by the way if you are looking at the extended complex plane of course it is homeomorphic to the you know uh, the riemann sphere and the riemann sphere is a subset of uh, R3 uh, real 3 dimensional space and that and since real 3 dimensional space is second countable uh, the Riemann sphere being a subset is also second countable okay. So the extended plane is also second countable okay after all you are just adding one more point at infinity and uh, 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 and if you want you can take all the uh, disks uh, uh, centered at infinity but of course you should not say fine, uh, finite radius okay. Uh, unless you are looking at the images in the Riemann sphere with the point at infinity corresponding to the north pole okay. But in any case uh, if you are taking a domain in the extended plane it is going to be second countable and uh, now if you take a function which has uh, poles in that domain then the set of poles uh, the, the poles by definition are isolated poles are by definition isolated singularities. So you have an isolated subset of a second countable set. Uh, of a second countable space an isolated subset will always be countable okay. The reason is because since the points of the subset are isolated you can cover each of those points by a member of the countable basis okay and you can choose different uh, members from the countable basis because the points are, are separated from each other because they are isolated and in this way you get a mapping an injective mapping from the set of isolated points in this case these are the poles to uh, the uh, this the countable base okay and the moment you get an injective map what it tells you is that whenever you get a map from a set to an inject an injective map from a set to another set which is uh, which is countable then your original set is also countable because a subset of a countable set is countable okay. Therefore, uh, you see the first observation is that a meromorphic function will have only countably many poles and then if you are looking at a meromorphic function on the whole uh, Riemann sphere okay, okay, which means you are taking the domain in the uh, extended complex plane uh, I often I keep saying Riemann sphere because I think of the extended complex plane as a Riemann sphere they are one and the same. So if your domain is uh, the whole extended complex plane and you are looking at a meromorphic function on the whole extended complex plane you have you get more what you get is not only is a set of poles countable it is actually finite mm. because uh, an isolated set of points uh, in a compact set 
uh, second countable set is going to be only finite okay because you know one property of compactness is that if you had an infinite subset it, it should have an accumulation point okay uh, therefore the model of the story is that uh, if you are looking at uh, a meromorphic function on the on the whole uh, extended plane then it should have only finitely many poles okay so let me so so let me write that down uh, so so here are remarks uh, uh, so remarks number 1 uh, the the set of poles in d is countable uh, uh, by second countability okay so uh, i'm just saying that uh, i'm just using the fact that the poles are of course isolated and i'm using second countability okay and the the second remark is that if d is the whole extended complex plane then uh, the set of poles is finite and that is because of compactness of the extended plane ok. Um, and then uh, there is yet another fact if uh, uh, you see uh, uh, the, the, the set of poles uh, 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 they form of course they are they are they, they are a set of isolated points because poles are by definition isolated but on the whole some of them might converge see they may be isolated points but they may get closer and closer and closer okay so like the sequence of 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 real numbers 1 by n okay the sequence of real numbers 1 by n consists of you know uh, it's a set of isolated points but it converges it converges to zero okay so you could have a set of uh, uh, poles okay you could have a convergent sequence of poles and then the fact is that this convergent sequence of poles has to converge only on the boundary it cannot converge in the interior. The reason is that if it converged in the interior you are going to get a point uh, which has to be in the, in the domain of f. So, it has to be either a, a singularity or it has to be a, non -sing, a point of non singularity, but then you know it cannot be a point of non singularity it cannot be a point of analyticity because it is approached very as close as you want by poles and if a if a point is a non singular point there should be a disk around that point where there are there are no singularities but since this limit is being approached by poles this cannot be a, a non singular point it cannot be a holomorphic point or analytic point it has to be therefore necessarily a uh, a singular point but then you you assume that the singular points are all going to be poles and here you have gotten a non isolated singular point that is a contradiction. Therefore, if uh, the set of poles of the meromorphic function has a convergent subset then it will converge only on the boundary okay and of course, uh, uh, this cannot happen if uh, in the in the case when the when the domain is the whole uh, uh, extended plane because when the domain is the whole extended plane okay the boundary is empty all right uh, and there are only finitely many points okay so um, well uh, uh, so let me write this down uh, 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 if uh, the set of poles has a convergent sequence of uh, uh, distinct points then uh, it has a limiting point in the boundary of T ok. Uh, uh, that point cannot it cannot converge inside T ok. So, so you know the 
so the so the model of the story is following the model of the story is when you are looking at meromorphic functions and you are of course if you are looking at meromorphic functions on the whole extended plane then there is not anything we are going to see that these are exactly the rational functions ok. We are going to prove that rational functions which are given by you know quotients of polynomials they are exactly the same as the meromorphic functions on the extended plane there is nothing more ok. But if your domain is not the extended plane ok then you uh, then the meromorphic functions uh, if you look at uh, uh, for example uh, if you are looking at meromorphic functions on the unit disc ok then it is possible that uh, you may have a sequence of poles that is converging and it will converge to a point on the boundary of the unit disc ok and behavior at that point of this uh, of this meromorphic function or this family of meromorphic functions is very very important topologically ok. So, uh, so, the, uh, so this is very very important that you need to study uh, the boundary points also ok especially when you have sequence of poles uh, tending to the boundary ok and of course what the remark says is that the if there is a sequence of poles which is converging it has to go to only to the boundary it cannot come cannot converge to your interior point ok. Um, well, uh, now, uh, so I, so let me go ahead with this this uh, fact that I told you that uh, you know uh, 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 rational functions are meromorphic and the converse holds. Uh, a rational function function uh, is given by a quotient of polynomials. of polynomials uh, f of z is equal to p of z by q of z ok. So, you know uh, now I want to tell you something I am now uh, all this time you know I was using the variable w I was writing f of w g you know the reason why I was use, using the variable w is because I wanted to study study the point w equal to infinity and the way I would do that is by studying g of z equal to f of 1 by z which is f of w by making the transformation w equal to 1 by z ok. But now we have uh, now by now we understand how to deal with the point at infinity. So, I am switching back to the variable z ok. So, uh, so z will be our complex variable from now on. So, uh, so rational uh, function is just a quotient of polynomials. So, uh, p q polynomials in z with uh, coefficients in uh, complex numbers of course you know uh, quotient of polynomials of course includes even constants ok you can take q to be 1 ok constants are also treated as polynomials of degree 0 ok. Uh, in fact in particular 0 is also considered as a polynomial constant polynomial and uh, therefore, you must understand that constants are also meromorphic functions ok and, uh, and of course, you know uh, uh, of course, a function uh, a rational function like this is certainly a meromorphic function on the extended plane that is very clear because if you take a function of this form if you take a function which is a quotient of polynomials ok it is going to where is it going to uh, where is it going to have problems with analyticity it is going to have problems with analyticity where the denominator vanishes. So, you take the those point and, and where the denominator vanishes is just the set of zeros of a polynomial that is only finitely many uh, points ok. And maybe uh, some of these uh, maybe the numerator polynomial also has zeros at some of these points. So, some of these zeros may cancel out ok, but then the, the fact is that this function cannot have poles at uh, points more than the set of zeros of the denominator polynomial ok and at all other points it is analytic. So, it is uh, an analytic function defined on the whole uh, you know uh, extended plane with having only uh, you know uh, finitely many points which are going to be poles. So, it satisfies the definition of a meromorphic function. So, you see therefore, a rational function is certainly a meromorphic function ok. And uh, the fact the theorem is that the converse is also true ok and so that is what I am going to talk about uh, uh, 
the rational function is analytic on uh, C union infinity except possibly at uh, the zeros of the denominator binomial hence it is meromorphic on the extended plane. So, so the theorem is that the converse holds. Uh, the converse holds. So, so here is the. So essentially, here is a theorem. Uh, if f of z is meromorphic on the extended plane then f of z is a rational function. Okay. So, there is no difference between meromorphic functions and quotients of polynomials. Okay. There is there is absolutely no difference and uh, you know uh, now, now this should you should now think of it like this. Uh, you, uh, the if you look at the polynomials in one variable, in say in the variable z with complex coefficients, that gives you the polynomial ring in one variable over the complex numbers c square bracket z, okay. And you know that is an integral domain if you have studied that in algebra, and then this integral domain has what is known as a field of fractions a quotient field. This is just like you get the rational numbers as a field of fractions when you look at the integral domain consisting of the integers. Okay. So, if you look at the field of fractions of, of the polynomial ring in one variable over complex numbers uh, you are going to get uh, just quotients of polynomials okay. and these are precisely the meromorphic functions on the extended plane. So, the moral of the story is that if you look at the extended plane, okay, the, fee, the, the set of meromorphic functions automatically is a field. It is not, none other than the field of fractions of the polynomial ring in one variable over C. Okay. So, you can see that. Um, so, well, uh, so let us let us try to prove that theorem. Uh, let me use another color. Uh, so, proof. So you see, um, uh, so 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 I'm given a function f f z. The function is uh, supposed to be considered on the extended plane, okay? Which means you are also consider the point at infinity, okay? And then you, the only information that's given to you is that the function is meromorphic, which means you know that it has only poles. And since you, you the set in consideration is the extended plane, which is compact, you know, I've already told you. There are going to be only finitely many poles, okay? And it's possible that infinity may be a pole or not, okay? So first, let let's first deal with infinity first, okay? And uh, so you look at the Laura expansion of the function at infinity, all right? And you know that uh, the Laura expansion of the function at infinity will consist of both positive and negative powers of z, okay? And of course, a constant term. And you know the singular part at infinity is the part that consists of positive powers of z. Okay. And you know uh, since, uh, so now you see infinity, uh, uh, there are three choices for infinity. You see infinity can be uh, either uh, a removable singularity okay, or it could be uh, a pole. Okay. And of course, it cannot be an essential singularity because uh, we, we, are, uh, we, have, we have assumed the function is meromorphic. So, it cannot have any singularities other than poles. Okay. Uh, now, if infinity is a removable singularity, okay, it means that the uh, 
the if you take the Laurent expansion at infinity okay the the principal part which consists of positive powers of z or there is a singular part has has no terms okay and uh, if you uh, assume uh, so it consists of only the constant part and the negative powers of z okay that is if you assume infinity is a is a removable singularity if you assume infinity is a pole which is the only other possibility then you know that the principal part of the singular part consisting of positive powers of z has to be finite so it has to be a polynomial of positive degree okay without a constant term and of course the degree will be the order of the order of the pole at infinity okay so for in any case you are going to get uh, 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 the singular part as either zero or a yeah, polynomial that is what I am trying to say at infinity and we if you take the function and remove that singular part whatever is left is going to be analytic at infinity that is what you must understand. So you see this this is something that we will use repeatedly what is the point about the Laurent expansion at a point of a function the Laurent expansion consists of a singular part or principal part and an analytic part and if you take the function and subtract the uh, the the singular part what you will get is only a Taylor series which will be actually the Taylor series of the analytic function which is given by the difference of the function and its singular part the moment you take away the singular part the principal part the function the, the function becomes analytic okay so uh, so this is a trick that you always use uh, if you want to extract the uh, the analytic part what do you do you take the function and subtract the singular part or the principal part okay so uh, so let me write that down uh, so let us let us first deal uh, with the point with the point at infinity the point z equal to infinity uh, if the Laurent expansion of f of z at infinity is uh, f of z is equal to uh, sigma n equal to minus infinity to infinity a n z power n uh, uh, that is sigma so let me write it like this sigma n equal to uh, uh, 0 to minus infinity a n z power n plus sigma n equal to 1 to infinity a n z power n z power n of z is this and now let me call this fellow as p infinity of z okay this p infinity of z is what this is the singular or principal part at infinity okay so let me so this is the this is the singular or principal part at z equal to infinity okay and of course uh, uh, whatever is left out here uh, this is the uh, this is the analytic part okay so you see of course you should take this Laurent expansion to be valid for mod z greater than r for r sufficiently large so it is so, so valid for mod z greater than r r sufficiently large so this is very important okay um, and so if you take so the point is that so if you take f of z minus p infinity of z okay this this is going to be this is analytic at infinity okay this is going to be analytic at infinity okay because f of z minus p infinity of z will only consist of the constant term a naught and negative powers of terms involving negative powers of z and negative powers of z behave well at infinity okay and of course I should tell you something uh, um, if you look at the point at infinity uh, 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 we, since we have assumed that f is meromorphic this p infinity of z is not actually a power series it is only a polynomial okay p infinity will of z will be 0 
if infinity is a removable singularity that is a point of analyticity for f and it will be a po po polynomial of positive degree equal to the order of the pole of f at infinity if infinity is a pole ok. So, so let me write that down note that uh, p infinity of z is 0 is 0 if infinity is a removable singularity of f and is a polynomial of positive degree equal to the order of f uh, the order of the pole of f at infinity. There is no other possibility you, you do not have the situation when infinity is an essential singular point ok because we have assumed f is meromorphic uh, the only singularities that are allowed are uh, poles ok fine. So, now what you do is you look at now let us look at uh, the uh, let us look at the other singular points see I have assumed f is meromorphic. So, it has only finitely many poles because it is meromorphic <coughs> on the on the extended plane which is compact that is very very important ok. There are only finitely many poles in the in the usual complex plane. Now, I forget the point at infinity because I have already dealt with it. I now want to keep track of the points on the plane where f has poles there are only finitely many let let me call those points z 1 through let us say z n ok. So, let us write that down let z 1 z 2 and so on z n be the uh, uh, poles of f of z in the complex plane ok. Uh, and again let me stress this is very very important that you are getting finitely only finitely many poles because you are you have assumed that uh, f is meromorphic on the extended plane the compactness of the extended plane is doing a big job here otherwise you need not get finitely many poles ok. Uh, so, uh, so you take these poles now you know you whatever you did at infinity you do at uh, each of those poles ok. So, take any of those poles then in a in a deleted uh, neighborhood of those pole each of those poles f admits a Laurent expansion and you know if you take the Laurent expansion if you take the singular part it is going to have only finitely many terms ok and though and the of course the uh, the highest negative power occurring will be equal to the order of the pole ok. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, let uh, the Laurent expansion of f of z around z k be uh, f of z is equal to sigma plus m a m equal to minus m to infinity and I will call the co co I will call the coefficients as a m k ok a m k and mind you it will be z minus z k to the power of m ok this will be the Laurent expansion the Laurent this is a Laurent expansion centered at z k ok and valid in a deleted neighborhood of z k and of course you know that will be actually a disk centered at z k uh, and radius will be equal to the distance from z k to the nearest of the other z j's ok. So, uh, uh, so valid valid in uh, 0 less than mod z minus uh, ok. Um, where of course, r k uh, I am not writing it r k is the distance of z k to the nearest of the other z j's j not equal to k ok. And what is the principal part at uh, z k it is going to have only finitely many terms ok. And uh, the highest negative power of z minus z k you are going to get that is going to be the order of the pole of f at z k. So, uh, the principal part uh, uh, the principal part
uh, of f at z k is therefore, p z k of f which is going to be uh, uh, let me let me uh, let me write as p z k of uh, of z and that is going to be sigma uh, it is going to be m equal to uh, uh, minus 1 to minus uh, 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 let me put um, t k uh, a m k into z minus z k to the power of m ok. Mind you uh, where t k is equal to the order of the pole uh, z k ok of f. Mind you these are all all the powers of z minus z k are in the denominator I am starting with m equal to minus 1 and going all the way up to minus t k and of course, the uh, uh, a a minus t k comma k is not 0 a minus sub t k uh, comma k is not 0. I mean this is the coefficient of the highest negative power of z minus z k right. Um, well, um, so this is the principal part at z k and now what you do is that you do the same trick as before uh, you use the fact that if you take the function and uh, subtract away take away the principal part whatever you are going to left be left with is going to be analytic because it is going to be a power series. So, it is going to represent an analytic function whose Taylor expansion at z k is exactly that power series which is the analytic part of the Laurent expansion. See the law you, you must always remember this the analytic part of the Laurent expansion is actually the Taylor series of what analytic function it is the it is the Taylor series of the analytic function which is given by the original function minus the principal part ok. So, uh, so let me write that down we, we need to use it uh, f of z minus p z k of z is analytic at z k ok. So, you see uh, so now look at the look at the scenario the scenario is I have this meromorphic function f there are these poles finitely many poles z 1 through z n ok and at each of these poles there is a principal part ok and if you take the principal part away what you get is something that is analytic at that point and of course there is also a principal part at infinity ok. Now what I do is I take the function and remove all the principal parts ok you take the function subtract the principal part at z 1 subtract the principal part at z 2 and so on you subtract the principal part at infinity you subtract all the principal parts and what are you going to get you are going to get an entire function on the on the on the whole uh, Riemann sphere and what is it going to be it is going to be a constant because of Liouville's theorem an entire function which is uh, we, uh, uh, you, if you are going to get an analytic function on the extended plane which means you are getting an entire function which is analytic at infinity and an entire function analytic at infinity by Liouville is has to be a constant it is a bounded entire function analytic at infinity means bounded at infinity bounded at infinity means it is a bounded entire function and it is constant. So, the moral of the story is you take the you take this meromorphic function and subtract all the principal parts you are going to get a constant and now you push all the principal parts to the other side you will get that the meromorphic function is a constant plus all these principal parts, but each of these principal parts are uh, rational functions and a constant is also a rational function. So, you have expressed the meromorphic function as a sum of finitely many rational functions therefore, it is rational and that proves the theorem ok. So, that is all. So, so let me write that down. Uh, uh, now, consider g of z is equal to uh, f of z minus uh, sigma k equal to 1 to n p z k of z. So, these are the principal parts at those n poles and then also take away p infinity of z ok ok. Now, uh, what you get is g of z <coughs> is analytic on the whole uh, extended plane and by Liouville 
therefore is it is a constant g is analytic on c union infinity hence a constant by Liouville, Liouville uh, so uh, f of z is equal to constant plus sigma k equal to 1 to n p z k of z minus plus uh, the <coughs> infinity of z which is metamorphic on the extended plane and 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 that is the proof of that theorem that uh, a function which is metamorphic on the extended plane mm -hmm. is just uh, 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 in fact is what I want to say is not of course it is metamorphic the point is it is rational which is rational. That is the point. We wanted to show that a metamorphic fun uh, function on the we wanted to show that a metamorphic function on the uh, extended plane is, ra is a rational function. Okay. So, uh, what you have got is uh, you have proved that a metamorphic function f is a constant plus these principal parts, finitely many principal parts. So, this part p infinity of z is a polynomial, okay, it could be 0 and these are all involving negative powers of z minus z case finitely many for each k okay and this is of course a rational function if you take lcm you uh, you will see that you will get a quotient of polynomials therefore it's a rational function and the beauty of this proof is that this proof also tells you that you get for every metamorphic function you get a partial fractions de decomposition the, the each p z k they are all the various terms of the partial fractions decomposition so, this proof in one stroke tells you that a metamorphic function has a partial fractions decomposition and is actually a rational function okay that is the advantage of this proof okay. So, uh, so I will stop with that.